our next event will be a Zoom presentation from Joe Baker herself on Saturday, October 29th at 10 a.m. Arizona time. Um, the reason we decided to discuss Longbourn this month is so we would have more meaningful things to ask Joe about when she talks to us next month. Um, I'm going to start by asking, does anybody want to volunteer their response to this novel? Elizabeth, go for it. Unmute yourself. <clears throat> um, I thought it was interesting uh, in that it gave a lot more physical detail and um, a different perspective, obviously, than um, Jane Austen would have. Yeah. Um, and I thought that um, that it was sort of grittier. Um, the in Austin, everything sort of has a comfort level. Everything's kind of middle class, upper class uh, comfort, and you don't see the underpinnings that much. Right. Um, and so I thought it was a, a useful perspective to get. And um, I uh, I liked well. I liked it, but I didn't like the 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 um, view I got of Elizabeth, especially <laughs> later on in the story when she yeah. ignored um, Sarah's request for trying to contact James or trying to contact the officer right. regarding James. And when she left service, um, she just she was she wasn't the Elizabeth that I new and loved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I certainly felt like this book taught me more about um, Regency England than Pride and Prejudice did. That might be because I feel like I've always known some of those things. Like there's so much a part of our understanding of the way the world works that, that Austin is surprising for her characters rather than her worldview. Whereas this, like, if nothing else, I had to look up some words. There were some words I did not know in this novel. Um, um, anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, I'll say something. Go for it. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh -huh. um, what I liked about a couple things I liked about it, the main thing I liked was I really appreciated, in a sense, I kind of went into it thinking, oh, well, this is fanfic, so we're going to basically see Elizabeth interacting with the servants, and she's going to be a big character, and Darcy's going to be a big character, and whatever, and we didn't see any of that, yeah. and it just was such a stark contrast yeah. and and really helpful at remembering we very seldom hear from or interact with or see the servants at all um, in Jane Austen's works. Um, they're hinted at here and there, but the, their invisibility yeah. we take for granted. But this was showing us, oh yeah, guess what? Who's invisible in this one? Yeah. And I yeah. think that that was really helpful um, perspective. And then there was another thing that uh, leapt out to me when I was reading it. Um, there's a scene where uh, the gardeners are visiting and they have young children in diapers yeah. and the diaper scene is just like PTSD. I mean, my kids are all grown, <laughs> thank God. But anyway, um, it was just one of those scenes where, you know, you're just seeing these servants having to do the absolute worst work possible yeah. with no acknowledgement, no awareness that this is difficult for them. And um, it also reminded me, I read a statistic mm, sometime in the last couple of years that, uh, that talked about how modern day men, meaning fathers of children, are far more participatory in childcare, including changing diapers, 
but that that statistic only leapt once disposable diapers became the norm. Before disposable diapers, they weren't going near it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of yeah. course, that just made me yeah. so much more grateful yeah. that I did not have children earlier than I did. <laughs> yeah. I I changed more of I changed more of my siblings' diapers using <laughs> cloth diapers than my father did. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. 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 Um, and Baker herself, in in the author's note at um, at the very back of the book. She says, in Pride and Prejudice, the footman appeared just once in the text when he delivers a note to Jane. Um, she gives the page number. It's it's the um, message, the the note about um, going to stay with, um, going to dinner with uh, the Bingley sisters. Um, and then when I was reading Longboard myself, um, for the third time, uh, I read it twice in the past two months, so I would actually know what I ta was talking about when I when we had this discussion. Um, Sarah is mentioned in Pride and Prejudice, Volume Three, Chapter Thirteen. Um, Mrs. Bennett is freaking out, and she says, "My dear Jane, make haste and hurry down. He has come. Mr. Bingley is come. He is indeed. Make haste, make haste." Here, Sarah, come to Miss Bennett this moment and help her on with her gown. Never mind Miss Lizzie's hair. So mm -hmm. it's after all the action and when Bingley has come back and he's, you know, Darcy has given him permission to actually be in love with Jane and propose to her. So that's that's where these characters come from. Mrs. Hill is mentioned repeatedly, um, repeatedly, probably a dozen times. Um, and then, you know, Baker just makes up uh, names and characters char for, for the other, um, other uh, servants. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that would have led to crucial aspects of the plot of Longbourn and that is the, the awareness that people had of the plight of servants because of a book called Pamela, which was published in 1740 by Samuel Richardson and which Sarah borrows from Elizabeth in, in this book. And it's about a very virtuous young woman named Pamela who works for a, a, a very distinguished uh, gentle lady who dies. And she, uh, Pamela continues to work at the house and uh, the master is Mr. B, a young rake who is constantly trying to seduce her. Uh, which is a danger and difficulty that um, young servant women faced uh, being being raped or sexually harassed by their employers or their employer's sons was a constant danger. Um, in Pamela, she, you know, she, she was she was a servant. She was lower class. She wasn't um, she wasn't even as refined as Mrs. Hill as Margaret. Um, but she just is so steadfast in her virtue um, that eventually the master falls in love with her and proposes, and they get married. And and people were horrified, just horrified at. Um, the interminglings of class. Like it just was not that, the, uh, the novel was popular, people read it, but they were really grossed out that a gentleman would marry a servant. It was not okay. Um, Samuel Richardson, um, his 
a subsequent novel was Clarissa, which is the longest novel in the English language. It has about 950,000 words. Um, it's an epistolary novel uh, to give you some idea of, of how that compares. Uh, War and Peace is less than 600,000 words. So it's it's 50% longer than War and Peace. And it also is about a rape about an attempted rape. Um, um, well, actually it's, it's about a successful rape. Um, one of the things that's important, I, uh, <laughs> I remember this clear from my undergraduate education 40 years ago. Um, rape was not okay if the rapee was a gentleman's daughter. It was fine if it was a servant girl. Um, and in fact, a book I really want to read right now is called The Sewing Girl's Tale, A Story of Crime and Consequences in Revolutionary America by John Wood Sweet. There was a review of it in the New York Times book review a few weeks ago. This guy is walking down the street. He sees a cute sewing girl. He bodily picks her up, takes her to a brothel and rapes her. And she brought charges against him and they were, he was acquitted. Um, but if somebody had done that, this, the, the bat, the main character, uh, his name was Loveless, um, was spelled L-O-V-E-L-A-C-E, but it was pronounced Loveless. Um, the male protagonist in Clarissa, he does the same thing to Clarissa and is therefore uh, open to a duel. He dies. He's shot to death because one of um, uh, Clarissa's relatives ch uh, challenges him to a duel. And you may remember in Pride and Prejudice, that's what Mrs. Bennett is really terrified is going to happen. That was really the only way... Um, the family of a dishonored woman who was essentially then at that point, just, just damaged goods, um, the way they had to get any compensation whatsoever. Okay, so that's the background, all of this concern about rape and, and seduction is another matter entirely. If you can seduce someone, then all bets are off, it's their fault. And so, the fact that Mr. Bennett seduces Margaret means that she can't accuse him of any sort of wrongdoing. It's entirely her fault. Um, one thing that occurs to me about Austin's work in general is that despite the fact that Sarah and Mrs. Hill worked very, very hard, they were at least safe from sexual violence. Um, because so many of Austin's families don't have sons. I feel like I've been talking a lot. And at this point, I want to know if anybody has anything else to say. <laughs> Any responses to anything I've brought up? Um, um, Was Clarissa lower class or was she? Clarissa uh, was a gentleman's daughter. Clarissa was oh. not lower class. Uh, and in fact, uh, she had money or she didn't, her her parents basically wanted to sell her off. It, it was a situation a lot like Elizabeth when Mrs. Bennett wants to marry her to Mr. Collins. Mm -hmm. That it, it was very much about um, getting an advantageous match that benefits the whole family instead of them, instead of the, the, the people in the marriage. Another topic that um, the book brought up was, was race yep. uh, with Bingley's uh, servant who was clearly also related yeah. to Bingley, yeah. which I thought was again, another, it's again, that invisible thing. It's like, we right. know this stuff was going on, um, yeah. but this novel actually foregrounded yeah. stuff that Austin didn't even really put in the background in most of her novels. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, the the issue of, of servitude is, I think, one of the most important issues in the book. Um, I listened to a presentation Joe Baker did for Chaunton House a while ago, and she said that one reason she wrote this book is the the awareness that as much as she loves this novel, she never, ever, ever could have been Elizabeth Bennet. Her family were were all in service. Um, and thinking about what that meant. Um, one of, I, I saw a Goodreads review that trashed the book that didn't like it because it insisted that all this concern about servitude and what it means and especially they were this person was especially incensed by um mrs hill's bed i think it was mrs hill let me check yeah mrs hill mrs hill this i i i'm gonna go ahead and read this this is um page 287 chapter 14 of volume three Mrs. Hill steeped the stoiled linen, blood and sweat and spunk and travel dust and the shiny grubbiness of things that have gone too long between washings in lye, prodding at it with the laundry tongue, swirling it through the murky gray water, and all the time bitterness like the eating up of a, the eating up acridity of the lie welled up in her, though she kept pushing it down and pushing it back and nailing boards over it. If Mrs. Hill had the ruling and not just the maintenance of Lydia, the little madam would be obliged to wash her own dirty linen just this once and see what other people saw of her. Um, there's a, a lot in here about the degradation of servitude, um, about how little freedom and dignity servants have and how hard they have to work for it. Um, there's a, a moment where James realizes that he sold his freedom to the British military because it had seemed such an inconsequential thing he hadn't known to value it at all. Um, and one of the issues that came up for me is, is the issue of contempt. Um, a book I really like um, is The Anatomy of Disgust by William Ian Miller. Um, and one of the things he talks about is, is different kinds of contempt. He uh, the fact that um, there is the contempt that the upper classes have for the lower classes, the contempt that the those who don't have to wash their own linen have for the people who do, the people who's, just to be crude, the people who shit someone else cleans up. Those people feel contempt for the people who have to clean up their shit. But the people who see that shit, the people who know it, the people who have to clean up other people's messes also feel a kind of contempt for the people who produce the mess. Um, you see this in, in, you see this several places in um, Longbourn. Uh, one is the passage I just read about Lydia's dirty underwear. Another is when um, Sarah gets drunk and goes to the Bingley ball. Um, I also love that. I I just loved that. Yeah, about um, you can't boil. I'm looking at the chat. Angela says I love that it also turns Elizabeth's petticoat being six inches deep in mud into a statement about her own carelessness. Yeah, um, Sarah sees her go and thinks you know you can't boil silk. Mm -hmm. Um, that it's just going to be ruined and never never um recover. Um, anyway, when when um. Um, when Sarah gets drunk and goes to the Bingley ball and kisses Ptolemy Bingley, he, they're, they're talking about, um, they're trashing their masters. He said, you'd think, what of you, that there's was nothing to do in all the world, but to dance and drink and laugh and eat and wake up at midday tomorrow and open another bottle of wine and do it all over again. Um, 
and she's a little too drunk to think clearly, but she she says, he, she thinks, he seemed to be onto something here. He dragged on his cigarillo, blew away smoke. Beasts they are, a lot of them. Don't you think? Just animals. Um, to be milked and fleeced and made into bacon. And, um, you know, because all they are, it's so much about, um, the servants are so intimately aware of the, their master's, you know, filthy physicality. Um, just how much maintenance has to be done to keep these people respectable. I just don't know if, I, I'm just so glad somebody as talented and as smart as Joe Baker did this because it would have been just really gross and terrible in, uh, in the hands of a lesser talent, Aaron. Yes, uh, I was going to share. I mean, some of you may have as well, or maybe this is a wouldn't admit to it, but I have read a fair number of the fan fiction novels, you know, the whole yeah. cottage industry. And that was my first wonder. Although I remember when I first uh, got Longborn and could tell already that the book was of a higher quality yeah. with better cover design, you know, so some indicators. Um, yeah. You mentioned the contempt that comes with understanding, you know, their physicality. Yeah. I felt also like the I don't know if it's contempt and it's been a, a bit of a time since I read it but Mrs. Hill's assessment of Mr. Bennett's his character also like she sees not just his filth but his moral weakness yeah um yeah. and it was interesting because of course Sarah is our you know the ingenue but and it's not just because we share a last name I felt like Mrs. Hill was the star for me and um the way that she crafts a relationship with Mr. Hill, like she is able to scramble, but the way that she speaks truth to power a bit to right. Mr. Bennett. So right. yeah, she's seen him, clearly she's seen him in intimate ways, in all the ways that means, and, but she sees his moral weakness, not just yeah. his physical filthiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, the, the thing of course is that the upper classes justified their treatment of the lower classes by imagining that they were morally inferior. You know, uh, there's a place where, um, where when Sarah first goes up and initiates sex with James, she thinks about how in their, people of their standing, nobody cares if you go to the altar pregnant. Um, and, and nobody did, that was, that was fine. Um, and that kind of thing was used to justify the inferior status of servants well look they get married you know they have sex before they get married blah 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 um uh so so the 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 physicality and the moral it's it's always it's uh they're always linked um and and what mrs hill there's i i I went and looked this up to, ah, okay. Um, this is chapter 15 of volume three. Uh, everything's been taken care of for Lydia. Mrs. Hill goes to the library and Mr. Bennett is there. He's old and tired and drunk and he's feeling all the disgrace. Um, he says, the first thing he says to Mrs. Hill is, I hope you've brought a fresh bottle of brandy. Um, um, and she, she hadn't, she just stood there. Mr. Bennett says, I don't know which is worse, my daughter's disgrace or my wife's blindness to it. Um, he there's some chat and she says for someone to be quite respectable i think they must be shown respect we build ourselves like the caddis flies in the river do out of the bits and pieces that wash around us 
He raised his eyebrows at this, then he nodded. She drew out the chair and sat down. Now it is settled, she said, and she is married. I just want note made. I want it noticed between the two of us at least what you would do for your daughter that you would not do for your natural son. Um, and he says, I was just, he says, oh, oh, if you only do what I suffered, Margaret. I thought about it every night, all the time he was gone, every night till that night he came back. All I wanted from the time he was little, from the moment you told me you were, all I was trying to do was be practical. She nodded, but there was no solution, was there? He said, being practical didn't solve anything. After a moment, Mrs. Hill spoke again. I realize why he did it, you know, why he took it, the king's shilling. Mr. Bennett blinked up at her, his eyes sore. He nodded for her to go on. No one seemed to care, so he didn't really care either. He didn't know that he could be loved. That's why he didn't think twice about throwing himself into harm's way. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Hill is the tragic character. Mrs. Hill is what gives this novel ballast. She's um she's what makes us understand the happiness of Sarah's outcome because it could have been so different. Sarah could have ended up as Mrs. Hill, but instead she got happiness. Um, Mrs. Hill is the tragic figure whose suffering buys everyone else's happiness. And I really do admire this novel. I, I know a lot of people you know, she she makes us think very differently about characters we adore, but I really admire it. And the fact that she was smart enough to make James a son, that, that the illegitimate child conceived by Mr. Bennett and his housekeeper is a son, because if he would have married Margaret, the entail would have been broken. He would have been so much richer. Uh, he 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 would have had his his financial fortunes would have been so much greater. He would have been degraded in shame because he married his housekeeper. But you know he would have been rich. So who cares? So yeah, I think she is. I think <clears throat> Mrs. Hill operates best as a foil to yeah. Mrs. Bennett, just showing. Um, even though, yeah, she's. Neither one is the gentleman's daughter, although Mrs. Hill is even lower status because she, her family is in service, yeah. but she is on every other level. Um, she is morally her superior uh, in terms of parenting. She's, she's just, she sees yeah. through yeah. Mr. Bennett, her understanding is superior. Yeah. Uh, and yet she's also very practical in how she's yeah. cobbled together a life for herself and she's yeah. more compassionate. Yeah. Um, and she would take Lydia in hand, whereas Mrs. Bennett indulges her in every terrible whim. Yeah, yeah I, I really liked her character as well. I agree with Aaron that for me, she was kind of the heroine of the piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and a, it's just, even worse. Those that wanted, those that want to criticize it for taking swings at our favorite characters. Uh, Darcy's a twenty-eight-year-old man. He could have yes. totally seduced any of these servants with yes. zero consequences. Bingley, likewise. I mean, these are not these are men who had every privilege, could have done yeah. whatever, and these servants are invisible, and it wouldn't yeah. have even uh, yeah. been a crime, basically. <laughs> and I so. There are some BBC programs that I really love. Um, some of them were like earlier this century, like 15, 20 years ago, like there was one called the Regency House Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. if, if anybody watched those, they yeah. might still be available um, through like um, either the Acorn app or um, the... Um, the PBS app um, and men who didn't want to, men like Darcy who had enough character that they didn't want to seduce the servants, that they wanted to be better. What they would have done is they would have slept with Mrs. Bennett. That that joke at that that was that that was um, that that was how people maintained um, 
happy sexuality without getting all the servants pregnant and all the is that there were lots and lots of sexual liaisons between postmenopausal women and young unmarried men. So the thing at the beginning about, um, you know, I'll go ahead and send you because Mr. Bingley might like you best of the party. It's not just a joke. That's great insight. And yeah. honestly, yeah. finally, something good for us postmenopausal women. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 I really did. If you can, if you can find, if you are interested in, um, more of the the broader history i i really recommend the regency house party if you can find it it's um a series of a, a bbc series of i don't know six to eight um regency cougars yeah that yeah that's awesome um uh more recent um series that have been done that might shed some light on this there's one called the victorian farm that it's got um a british historian named uh ruth goodman and then two british archaeologists and they go and pretend to be farmers and stuff and 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 they're very they're very educational um and i felt i just watched them recently um and I felt like I could visualize a lot of the stuff going on on the farm better, having having seen that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's no way Darcy was a virgin. There's just there's just not. It's it's really not in the realm of of possibility that um, he was inexperienced. And one of the best things we can hope is that uh, he hadn't picked up syphilis and didn't give it to Elizabeth. Not that I would have mentioned that in a class with a lot of undergrads. I don't know. Maybe I would have. Um, um, one of the things, well, I don't know. Any any other comments on that? Any other other things we want to say about that? Any of that? Um, I, I What you said, you got me thinking about Darcy. And of course, that makes sense. And I just was thinking... Yeah, the big loss for me in the book was um, my change in perception of Mr. Bennett because we love him. Yeah. And um, not that I don't love him, but it, that was, and she did, I mean, Baker did such a skillful job that it felt like, yes, of course, this is the yeah. other side of Mr. Bennett. So it wasn't the pain of, I don't like her take. It was, I yeah. never saw that about yeah. him. Yeah. but she's right and that was yeah. I think I'd shared with you that I love the book but it was Mr. Bennett I had to grieve a little my yeah. feelings yeah. Mr. I, I I think, absolutely feel the same way yeah yeah I think one of the things um that gives me a little bit of grace for the upper class or middle class gentry class whatever in the novel is if you consider how constrained their lives are versus yeah. the servants i mean being invisible has the benefit of yes it's degrading work but you can just pick up and go and you can do something else you can go sleep with that person that you want to sleep with because you could um you know get married after and it's fine you just don't have the same social constraints um and i think sometimes that lack of choice for austin's characters I mean, it's one of the things we like about it because the constraints frame the novels in a way that feels right. familiar, but it's also like a crappy way to live. Um, yeah. Just the fact that you don't have those freedoms. Yeah, yeah. There's there's no, I mean, um, uh, I, I was trying to find one of my own Facebook posts about Pride and Prejudice. So I did a, a search on Facebook and I found one of my friends who was just like, I'm trying to read this novel. It's so Pride, Pride and Prejudice. I'm trying to read Pride and Prejudice finally, and it's just such trash. And why does anybody care? These people are so. And it's like, well, it's funny. I mean, you know, and it's like, and it's, it's, uh, I mean, you know, they're still nicer than the Brontes. <laughs> um, and, and it, it really was, um, what, 
a real class of people were limited to. And Austin, of course, never pretended. She, she, I, I, I imagine her listening to this conversation and being like, well, duh. Yeah, I didn't talk about the servants. Like, duh, I had my little two bits of ivory that I was working on. Like, what do you, you know, I, she kind of knew her place. Um, and she inhabited it so very well. And it goes back to the conversation we had about a room of one's own uh, and the fact that um, Virginia Woolf points out that um, that oh, I can't believe well all right I can't believe I'm not going to find this I didn't bother to look it up because I thought for sure I would be able to find it for um that ah uh, genius like Shakespeare's is not born among laboring uneducated servile people it was not born in England among the Saxons and the Britons it is not born today among the working classes so um we have Jane's we have Elizabeth Bennett's story because Jane Austen was able to write it. We don't have Sarah, nameless person, her story because there was no one who could have written it. There, you know, nobody who knew that story intimately um, could tell it except, you know, Samuel Richardson and, and he still, he, you know, he had to make it a happy story. He was the one who came closest. Um, and I mean, seriously, like, especially among people like uh, um, the guy who wrote Tom Jones, Henry Fielding. Henry mm -hmm. Fielding wrote a response to Pamela called Shamala, where it's actually the servant girl who is always trying to seduce her employer, you know, so she can get money off him and the standard thing about, you know, rapacious female sexuality that's all about trapping men. Um, so yeah, it, it just took a really long time before anybody cared enough about- Well, if they didn't, um, if they didn't have everything, we wouldn't have to trap them, <laughs> historically. <yes. laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that which was which is the, why now that we can have yeah. it ourselves, we don't yeah. have to because exactly, who cares? yeah, which is which is which really is responsible for so many changes in in uh, marriage practices. Yeah. I also wanted to mention that being a bastard is not just um is is not just a socially stigmatized position it also has real practical effects bastards couldn't inherit property um even in the united states until like the 1970s uh if you were an illegitimate child and say your mother was killed in a terrible accident you couldn't get as much as the insurance company, get as much from the insurance company for her death as a legitimate child. Um, so James's position really would have been um, just as precarious as, as Baker portrays it as. I will also tell you something that um, I'm a fan of George Orwell, um, whose real name, by the way, was Eric Arthur Blair, um, uh, which sounds a lot more hoity-toity than, than George Orwell. That was by design. He was um, kind of a lower upper, upper middle class. He had some uh, ancestors who were gentlemen 
Um, he had a, a, a great great grandmother who was like the eighth daughter of an earl. Um, he says that one of the reasons for um, class hatred in Britain is that the lower classes smell. He writes that uh, as part of his conclusion to a book called The Road to Wigan Pier, where he goes and lives with um, the most servile classes uh, uh, in British society. Um, um, and, and um, you know, he was very much a champion of these, the lower classes, but he said that the, the real reason for um, just, yeah, the upper classes hatred of the lower classes that they stink. And that I think is also important when you consider Mrs. Hill's consideration of um, Lydia's dirty underwear. And another thing I learned that that uh, P, uh, BBC series I mentioned about um, uh, the the Regency House Party, there would be baths once a week for the non-servant people. For the you know the so. Um, and the order of the bath was in order of social standing and everybody used the same bath water. So Mrs. Bennett would have taken a bath first and then Jane would have taken a bath in the same bath water. And then Elizabeth would have taken a bath in the same bath water and then Mary and then Kitty and then Lydia. Um, and so when Lydia got married, um, she would have taken a bath after Mrs. Bennett and before Jane. Um, I still haven't seen Parasite. If, I don't know if you're paying attention to the, the chat. Angela just said that's also a central, central plot in the movie Parasite that won Best Picture in 2020. The lower class servants smell like public transportation like an old radish. Yeah. Um, On the... Um, on the conversation about uh, the illegitimate births, <clears throat> my grandmother uh, was married to her husband and was pregnant. And the sheriff comes to the door one day and asks, is, is this the residence of Mr. So-and-so? And she says, yes, I'm his wife. Can I help you? And the sheriff said, well, you're not his wife because he has another family in North Carolina. And, and so she... So that was a huge scandal, and she, she, um, she, she had to give up the baby because um, if if she had left the hospital or was going to take the baby, it, it under the section of inquiry about father, it would have said bastard. And if yeah. if a couple took that baby out of the hospital, that name would be on the gift certificate. And, yeah. and she didn't want she didn't want a child of hers to yeah. grow up yeah. in the circumstances that would have evolved. So yeah, yeah. There's a a book called Bastard Out of Carolina by Dorothy Allison, um, that is about a, a bastard and you know the fact that her her uh, um, it was put written on your birth certificate. If you were a bastard, you could never escape it. It was on your birth certificate, right. and it had legal ramifications for you your entire life. And that only changed within the lives of most of us on this conversation. It was, um, it was basically, you know, the sexual revolution that, um, that when people said, oh, okay, maybe this matters. Um, and even still, you know, uh, Americans place more value on that than a lot of people, but it it doesn't really. I mean, we divorce so much. Um, I I this is something I've studied a lot. I read a book called The Marriage Go Round by a guy named Andrew Churlin, and he says that um, a child in Sweden whose parents are not married 
stands a better chance of having his parents still be together when he graduates from high school than a parent than a child in the United States whose parents are married. They're more likely to have separated or been divorced. So um, marrying the parent of your child does not in any way increase the stability of the relationship. We were just off, I mean, you know, yeah. Society was terrible. And one of the whole reasons I spent a little time um, refreshing my memory about this, uh, Wikipedia said that one of the reasons for the bastardy laws was to, was explicitly, yeah, was, was explicitly to punish um, men and women who conceived illegitimate children. You know, they, um, uh, I mean, it's that the thing from the Bible of, the sins of the parents will be visited on the heads of the children. Society explicitly set out to do this. Um, punish the parents by making the child suffer. So. Can we. Um, we've, we've got about 10 minutes until three o'clock. This can go as long as we want. Um, uh Feel free to either raise your hand if you want to speak, or you can do, um, you can use a chat. Um, I would like to just say a little bit about how beautiful I think this book is. I, I just think Joe Baker writes lovely, lovely, lovely sentences. Um, one of the delights for me was just the the beautiful prose. Um, but, and I marked a whole bunch of them, um, and I don't know why none of them are suddenly appearing right now. But I am in, I'm open to any criticisms or praise you want to make. Um, um, who, I, yeah, me too. Um, especially since Wickham is still out there. Um, you know, what if, if um, uh, Wickham is, we should, we, actually, we should talk about Wickham. He's so much worse. Like as bad as he is in Pride and Prejudice, he is so much worse in this book. He is terrible. Um, and I never noticed until this book, how much Wickham sounds like Wicked. Oh yeah. I mean, I first read I first read Pride and Prejudice in like 1979. It really has taken me a long time to catch on. <laughs> He's so bad. He's just so bad. Um And yeah, I hope that things are okay. I would hope that um, Mrs. Hill managed to get some concessions um, from Mr. Bennett about James's well-being. That that there would have there would have been some money um, set aside for them. That maybe he could, you know, since um, thank you, Osmina. Um, I, I hope I said your name right. Um, uh, um, since Sarah's parents were in trade, you would hope that um, like Mr. Bennett could set James up with a trade um, so that they could be respectable. Diana, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to ask, do you think that after the whole Lydia fiasco, when James and Sarah returned to Longbourn, do you think Mr. Bennett will have been humbled a bit by that to say, okay, maybe I can do something for James and Sarah? I would certainly hope so. I would too, but I kind of doubt it. <laughs> well, I, yeah. Because through the whole thing, he kept saying, well, what else could I have done? What else could I have done? So I would hope so too, but I don't hold a lot of hope for that, I'm afraid. 
I don't, what, uh, Elizabeth, what do you mean by we don't know what Collins will do? Like, would he, um, you mean about James? Oh, you mean, because taking over, oh, you mean what? Mr. Yeah, Collins when he, when he, when he inherited. inherited. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Though I would hope they would not still be working there, like forever. Like they, they, um, I mean, they, they had a reason to go back because well, okay so what do you think would you think they were going back to visit or to go back to stay well i think they were going back to longbourn village but that doesn't mean that they wanted to go back to longbourn to be servants there yeah. at that point james knew his parentage he knew that mrs hill was his mother and mr bennett was his father so um even though the law really limited the claims he had on his parents he still knew he had some yeah um and we know mrs hill loved him yeah. and we know that sarah knew that mrs hill loved him so um i mean who you know who knows it it was interesting to me that longborn was the final word of the novel yeah, I just I just kept can't help thinking, can't help wondering. Yeah, how would they make their way after that? Yeah, or, yeah. or would they yeah. be trapped in going back into servitude? I, yeah, yeah. I hope I not. Also, I also don't know. I mean, it, it's possible. I I did not bother to research um, the the laws on um, desertion and so forth. If the war was over, it's it's possible i don't know this this is i'm just guessing but it's it, it occurred to me that maybe uh james would no longer be under threat if the war was over mm. i i should probably look that up um it would be weird like for me if i had been sarah it would be super weird to work there if like elizabeth ever came home and visited you know um one thing Sarah says, somebody mentioned being invisible and the Angela mentioned um, how being invisible gives you certain kind of freedom. And, and one of the things Sarah says when she goes to leave, um, it's the first time she, she tells Elizabeth she wants to leave and um, <coughs> And this is page 322. Um, Darcy studies her like a household item that had abruptly ceased to function and on which he now found himself obliged to have an opinion. He really dislikes being noticed by him. Um, she preferred for, for all the ways it made her feel crappy when he just didn't even see her there, it was still better than being noticed by him. You're, you're not unmuted, Angela. Angela, unmute yourself. Ah, better. Um, yeah, I mean, he's literally objectifying her, yeah. seeing her yeah. as an object, yeah. um, which obviously is really, I guess, demeaning and, and it's worse than being invisible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're also right that Mr. Bennett always... Mr. Bennett always takes the path of least resistance. Yeah. yeah. Um, we do know that he and, and uh, at the end, the book tells us that Mrs. Hill gets what she wanted, always wanted, which is Mr. Bennett all to herself. Um, and so they're sitting in the library eating cake and drinking port every evening, or at least he is. Um, and at that point, it might be easier for him to placate her um, and just do something for James. Um, it's really, truly a question of, of yeah, whether- Yeah, she needs to, she needs to, 
She needs to learn that lesson from Mrs. Bennett. You just have to make his life miserable until he does what you want. <laughs> That's basic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. else did Lydia get to go to Brighton? <laughs> That's right. You exactly. are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't thought about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye, Judy. We'll do, um, I don't know. What else does anybody want to say? Are you glad you read it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like Aaron said earlier, I'm, I read a lot of the fanfic, probably way more than I should. Yeah. And 80% of it, I don't even enjoy. But yeah. this was in the 20%. I really, really thought it was well-written. Like you said, yeah. the prose was well-written. Um, there, are, there are a few fanfic authors out there who just are really head and shoulders above the rest. And this is one of those books that yeah. truly rose to the top, I thought. Yeah, yeah. No, it's in a, it's in a, a it transcends the category of fanfic. It becomes yeah. a, good on its own on its own merits and stands alone um though of course i read it because it is fan because it's austin fanfic that's why i read it but i am glad i did uh i looked at uh, at some of her other novels um and thought about because it honestly it never occurred to me until i really thought about the fact that she's going to be speaking to us on saturday october 29th at 10 a.m arizona time um that um that, oh yeah, she's written like half a dozen other novels. Maybe I should look at one. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I will do that. But it 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 is um um it's my favorite Austin fanfic. I wonder if anybody else on today's call has read any of her other books and has any recommendations. Anybody? Any of you read anything else by Joe Baker? Yeah. yeah yeah well i'll probably give it a whirl too i mean we have six weeks yeah yeah that's enough time to get through a, a one or two yep <laughs> that's what i think well it's three o'clock so and I Unless, unless somebody has, is dying to say something else. And maybe even if you are, maybe we can still quit. Thank you. you Thank you very much, Holly. You did a wonderful job. Thank You're you, welcome. Holly. Thank you very Go much again. for coming. Thank you. Thank you I so hope much. you all enjoyed it. We yeah. sure Thank did. You. Yes. Thank all you. All right. Awesome. Thank well, you. the next book, actually, I think the next thing we're going to discuss, um, It'll be in six months. Next year, we're going to do um, What Matters in Austin, which is a work of criticism, and Cold Comfort Farm, which uh, by Stella Gibbon, the main character's goal is to write a book as good as Persuasion when she's 50. So anyway, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank we'll you. see you later. Bye-bye.